This episode is powered by denmeditation.com. The meditation is the primary focus. The bigger goal is for people to understand and love themselves, thus creating more harmony in the community at large. To find out more about Den Meditation's teacher training programs, retreats, and all things Den Meditation, go to denmeditation.com. Welcome to Den Talks Podcast. This is Tal, your host and the founder of Den Meditation. All right, you guys, we have one of our favorites. I know he's one of yours. We have Paul Selig here. He is now the author of 11 books, so many of them New York Times bestsellers. He is just an incredible channeler. So he would hate that I'm even introing it that way because he's always says, I don't write the books. I'm just, you know, they channel through me. He is one of the most humble humans, but so brilliant. And what I love, I love chatting with him because he has an amazing way of teaching what is coming through him. And also you can tell he's really learned you know, I'm sure the hard way as he talks a little bit in this episode of how to kind of live by what he's learning. We talk about where humanity is and how we are all in a place of reckoning. I think it's really interesting with what's going on in the world. He talks about how anything that you personally on a small level or the world on a larger level has created out of fear will have to be undone and recreated. And I think we can see that happening now in many different forms. So we talk a lot about that. We talk about the idea of what forgiveness means and how important it is. But then also we have a really just lovely, casual conversation about where he is in his life right now. And I'm telling you, I've now been talking with him for how many years? And it's really great to just see how much of kind of his own work he has embodied and how much his life has shifted because of that. He's always a student as well as the teacher. And so he's such a real human. And so you can look at him and understand that the things he is teaching and that he's channeling really are brilliant because you can see the effects it's having on him too. So take a listen, let us know. We know we love Paul. He is the best. We're so grateful for him. I hope you enjoy the episode. Have you felt now, I mean, how many years have you been working with them? I mean, I started to open up when I was 25. I started to hear for other people. I'd I'd gotten some bangs over the head in direction early, you know, 25. But I don't think I started to do what I call channeling until I was in my early 30s which is, you know, now 30 years ago. And, um, and channeling the way that I do now with the lecturing, that didn't kick in until I was 48. I had been working until then. Um, I didn't see, visually see any of them until, my God, I, I must have been, you know, 50 or so. You know? So it's been a process, really, of a, of a very weird relationship. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you feel like it's evolved or changed? I, I think I've become a more refined instrument for them. There have been now, what, 12 books. The 12th one's not out yet. So I think I've become a better instrument. Um, I have a very different life as a result of this in every way. Um, But it's in some ways, it's sort of the same relationship it's always been. I mean, you know, I trust that I'm going to hear. When I first started, I didn't always trust that they would show up. When I showed up, I was always terrified. I have to tell people to go home. When did that end for you? I was, it's funny because I've been writing about all this stuff, which I've never done before, really. But there was a time when I was in my early 30s, and I was fairly new, and I was starting to do groups for the first time. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I wasn't, again, lecturing. They were bringing through energy coordinates, but I was always terrified that I wouldn't be able to hear. And I was about to do a group, and the guide said, before the group started, do we have permission to merge? And I went, okay, and I felt this whole sort of download. And from then, it's never been like I'm going someplace else or reaching to something to hear. When I first started, it was very much like I had a tin can on a string up to my ear, and I was hoping somebody else would get the other can and talk into it, and I just didn't know. And so it changed early on. The process became simple. Um, 
but my abilities to hear were refined enormously through the doing of it when I quit smoking, which was not until I was 48. And they told me I needed to if they were to continue to work with me. That's when the lecturing started you know, in my system. I was a four-pack-a-day guy, so... And what was that for them, just the vibration of what the smoking was doing? I think the smoking was probably killing me on a practical level. Um, it was also... It was, it was interference. I mean, I didn't know this until I quit, but, you know, when I quit, I was suddenly seeing detail in the physical landscape that I'd never seen before. I really was shrouded in smoke, and I was doing that, I think, for protection. Just the same way I used weight. It was a way to have a buffer. I don't, I was I'm super clear sentient. I didn't really understand that. You know, very porous. And I think that was keeping me safe, but it was also hindering what could happen through my physical body. And my physical body is very much present in the process of channeling, it always has been. So when you said you started literally seeing things in the landscape, when wasn't, you stopped- It wasn't clairvoyance, it was practical. That's what I mean, what was the first thing you noticed that you're like, the details in the building, the architecture in New York, all of these, the grill work, and. You know, the, the, the freezer, the stone freezes on the buildings. They'd always been there. I passed them every day. I never noticed. Huh. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you have like a, a dusty, dirty house and you live with that for a long time, you don't notice the newspapers packed up on the floor. You just don't see it. And that's what I saw. I saw what was in the way and then it was gone. It was crazy. But it was the beginning of a process of, of, again, opening up at another level. My, my psychic abilities kicked in when I stopped drinking when I was 25. And so it seems to me that every time I clear out a level, I am more proficient and my system is used more readily or capably than it was prior. Are you a big dreamer? A big dreamer? Yeah, I suppose. You know, do I put tremendous stock in them? Not always. I know the ones that are for me to remember, and I've had dreams. When I was nine, again, I've been writing about this, so it's up, I dreamt about walking up a flight of stairs to a stone fountain, you know. Stone stairs to an oddly shaped fountain that was covered in, you know, bright red and gold leaves. And I had never been there before. I never forgot the dream. When I was 13, my family was going through Vermont, and we stopped at Goddard College, hmm. and I saw the fountain, I blew my mind. And then when I was 30, 31, I was invited to teach there. They asked me to come and apply. I was like, what the fuck is this? And there was the fountain. And, um, and in a funny way, because that fountain was there, the years that I was developing as a psychic and as a channel, where I wasn't doing the life that I thought I was supposed to live. I thought I'd failed miserably, you know, at my own idea of a career. I was having a nice career as an academic that I didn't even care about. <laughs> I, like, I like teaching a lot. Um, I think that that kept me going, the fact that I was in this place that I had dreamt about as a child, and maybe I was where I was supposed to be in spite of anything else that I thought. And truthfully, I don't think the books would have ever come if I hadn't been at Goddard. It was a faculty member there wow. who um, said, you know, maybe you should write. And I said, I'm never going to write again. And the guy said, well, we have a book to write. And if you take two weeks, we'll do it. And, um, and that's when they began delivering the book. So it's all connected. But How yeah. does it feel to write again now, now that you tell me you're doing all this? It's really interesting. You know, I mean, I, when I first started, I, you know, I taught college for 25 years and I was good at it, NYU and Goddard. And, and I like telling stories and the students liked my stories. So I went, okay, I can tell a story. And um, initially, when I started doing my own work for this project, a memoir thing, I was kind of saying, what did, I, what did I ask for this for? Why am I doing this? Who wants to, who wants to revisit pain? Because there was a lot of pain. And none of my story was very graceful. And if people want some tone about some enlightened person, they're not going to get it from me because I don't claim that. You know, you are the most humble human I've ever no, spoken I don't, to. I don't, anybody I know, I know. Any, we argue about it every I time. I don't trust it. <laughs> you know, it goes, hi, I'm enlightened. I'm going, well, yeah. You know, but... 
How do you treat your dog? How do you, you know, it's, it's all about how we live our lives, finally. It's not I know you treat dog. your dogs well. I do treat my dogs <laughs> well. Um, so I don't know what I was saying. Um, about how the, the process of writing has been. Writing, you know, it's interesting now. Now I'm starting to understand it because I'm actually having to look at big things about my whole evolution as a channel and which began when I, you know, really after I studied energy healing when I was 30, maybe, you know, the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and I was had a teacher who was a big deal at the time and a mentor who was completely codependent with me and it was nutty, nutty, nutty. <laughs> but I was really, when I look back in those years, I was really so devoted to, to source because I'd had an experience of it. And I thought, well, nothing else matters. If, you, if this is real, nothing else matters. And that kept me going for a long time. So revisiting that time is interesting because I think I've come to, I'm not going to say a laziness because I'm not lazy, but um, I'm more comfortable. I'm not, you know, worrying if I, if I have enough money to buy dinner, which is where I was in my early years. I was poor, 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 nearly homeless after I got sober. It was not easy and graceful. And I was right out of Yale. It was nuts to go from, you know, seeing everything before you as this great life unfolding and then suddenly to be, you know, living in church basements in 12-step meetings trying to just keep your head above water, which is what it was like for me. You know, but my path is my path. So I'm having to revisit it and it's not fun, but it is interesting and I'm seeing the connections and I'm also thankfully, thankfully seeing how far I've come, you know, in my life in spite of myself often. You know? Well, I mean, it's, it's amazing when you look at it. And I mean, even when you say you're like, it's not laziness, but I'm just comfortable. And some of it is because you're in a more secure spot, but yeah. do you think some of it is also a little bit of what you talk about or they talk about in this book and in, in the innocence, which we're here mm -hmm. to chat about a little bit today mm -hmm. too, of this idea of at one point they say, you know, if there's effort, then you're actually not connected to source. Well, I don't know. I, if they say it, I guess it's true. That's, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I, there's an old Emmett Fox teaching that I remember. And he used to say, if you're going to pray, pray with a feather. Because in spiritual work, effort is, defeats itself. And I think that's true. But honestly, I'm having to get up and sit down every day and do this work. I'd rather be doing something else. I'd rather be, you know, having fun, you know, and it's not that the work isn't fun, but I, I'm, I'm disciplined. But the idea that, and this is the big, the big takeaway for me, is that it doesn't have to be so hard as mm. I used to think it did. I was initially very invested in how hard my path was because I thought it was noble, but it was a way of justifying or at least understanding Suffering. that there was struggle. There was struggle. I would, I'd be lying if I say that there wasn't, you know. So some people get into this stuff and they flower and bloom and it's exciting and wonderful to see. And others of us fall apart, which is kind of was my experience, you know. Suddenly, when you go from a world where there is no such thing as God or something like God to one in which there is, it's kind of like moving to another planet. It's a trip. And for me, it was a foundational restructuring of who I thought I was, what I thought mattered, who I was supposed to be. I mean, all of that stuff was suddenly just spinning around me. And I'm going, what do I do with any of this? And I didn't know for a period of time. But it was all, I think, part of it. And it always is. So people have different roads, you know, when I... I remember going to some meditation when I was maybe in my late 20s that somebody was offering. And she was like saying to everybody, oh, look at your spiritual path unfold before you. And people were saying, well, I see the birds singing and the flowers are blooming when I walk by. And I had a pickaxe and I was climbing up the side of the witch's mountain in the Wizard of Oz. It's like, and I was proud of that. Oh, boy. This it should is be. Well, no, it was, it was hard. But I also would go to these healing circles 
that people were throwing and I had holes in my socks. I didn't know you had to take your shoes off. I was mortified. <laughs> I mean, that's where I was. It's happened days. to me before too. Oh my God. Or like, you're just, yes, that's so funny. But you know what? It's funny because sometimes I will lead a, a guided meditation and I'll almost describe kind of this like moving through this stuff as like taking a machete through like a really dense like thicket of whatever because it is like when you're actually in it it's there's a lot of dismantling happening and it can be painful well i i just think that the idea that this is supposed to be convenient is not true right it's, it's a myth you know i i think sometimes people think that they can have a ceremony and then it's like getting upgraded to a new hotel room suddenly and you don't have to go back and look at what you left in the old one. But you know, what we've created and what our life has been is stuff that we're still accountable for and responsible to. And I think having to, I don't think that anything really gets shifted until we're willing to look at it and see it. Doesn't mean we have to suffer through it. But, we, but if I don't say, yeah, I have a part in this, I'm suppressing it or bypassing it. I don't think that really works so well. I kind of love that, the ceremony with the hotel room analogy, yeah. because it's funny, because when I, I remember having a client once, and I teach a class, I teach a Kundalini-based class, there's a lot of energy mm -hmm. moving, and a lot of people afterwards, there's usually a huge energetic release. Yeah. So people are feeling, yeah. I mean, not always, but a lot of times they'll feel either euphoric or like, oh, thank God, or... And so they kind of get addicted to that. Yeah. And then I've, <clears throat> there's been a couple of people I've worked with that then the stuff that comes up because of that, because there's been like a release, all of a sudden it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to look at that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. And I always tell people it's in your own time. Like, and I, mm -hmm. and I tell them, I'm like, yeah, I think it's bringing up the stuff you actually have to do the work. This is the part, like you don't just get the upgrade. Yeah. It's like, now is the, like, you might've done the ceremony but now comes all this stuff that comes with it that you have to look at it, and like you said, own it. And some people aren't ready to do that, and that's okay. You have to, you have to want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And um, but I've I've noticed that and I've always said that, like, hey, in the moment it can feel really good, but the real work happens in all the moments in between. It's not always just the ceremony. It's not always just yeah. going to that class or doing that one meditation. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's the in between. Yeah. It has been for me, you know, I had an experience that people said sounded like a spontaneous Kundalini awakening when I was 25. And um, I didn't know what it was. And I, and I met somebody recently because I described what happened afterwards, which is I did kind of fall. I, I didn't know who I was. I was like, who am I now? I, well, 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 you know. And the guy said, oh, you know, you had an unprocessed Kundalini awakening. And that's and why unprocessed, and unprocessed, like unintegrated, unintegrated. And I said, well, that's possible. That makes sense. I didn't know what it was. I just knew somebody gave me a mantra, which turned out to be a Kundalini mantra. And I was trying to teach myself to meditate. And I asked to, to wake up and all this stuff started coming through me. Like, what is this? So I don't know if I made it harder or something happened, but I asked for it, you know, but I just I don't think I just don't think it's supposed to be convenient. It doesn't mean it has to be miserable. Truthfully, the joy certainly outweighs the other stuff in this, in this work. I mean, and like you said, look where you are now. Look where you are in your life. You're living, you know, in Ma Maui, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, your whole life is just different than what you would have imagined. Yeah. I wouldn't have chosen this. I wouldn't know that I could. It wasn't on the menu of things that were available to someone like me. And isn't that kind of what they say? Because it's interesting you said someone like me. Yeah. I feel like what they say a lot in all the books, but they really bring it up a lot in this one is almost like if you can even imagine it, you're not, you're not entering the frequency entirely because it's almost beyond what you know now. Like everything you know now is so yeah. weighted down um, by all your past memories, which we'll get into yeah. more with this book, that you, you shouldn't know what's on the menu. Yeah. 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 The guides say we're always ordering off of the menu of what we think we're allowed to have. And we do, you know, and the idea that there's something or some aspect of us perhaps that might know better or have a, a higher ideal for who we are and how we can know ourselves and what we can be realized through is something that doesn't necessarily occur to us. There's no reason it, it should. 
I mean, the guides have said that every, our entire experience in this reality, our understanding of this reality has been informed by a, a false belief in separation, this belief that we're not one with source. So consequently, all of our memory is faulty and how we see anything is actually informed by um, something that was actually never true, but has been perpetuated by us. It's almost like it was like me when I stopped the smoking and suddenly I could see what was there. It was like the dust that was on the lens was just cleared off. And I was like, oh, my God, this was always there. I didn't know it. It's a lot like that, I suspect. But it's another way of experiencing ourselves. And consequently, I think what we might be able to know ourselves through. Well, also in you saying kind of this Kundalini awakening, you feel like you might have had that was unprocessed. Mm -hmm. And you said it was so untethering for you because you didn't know who you were. You didn't know what was happening. I mean, do you wonder if you if somehow it brought you to the upper room, like for a moment you were there because it is this idea of letting go of all kind of sense of identity? No, I don't think it. When I say I didn't know who I was, it's not like I came out of the experience going, who am I? It was an incredible <laughs> awareness of, I don't know who I am. And at the time I had platinum blonde Billy Idol hair and a lot of black leather. And, you know, I was this rock and roll. Oh, I need to see a picture. They're, they're there. I got them. Um, <laughs> you know, and suddenly I wasn't sure and I wasn't sure what mattered. You know, I had gone from... I got clean um, maybe a year or less than a year after I, I got out of Yale for graduate school. And I was a playwright. I was getting produced in New York and in London. Everything was in magazines. It was like all this hot stuff. And suddenly I was broke with no awareness of how to care for myself, really. I'd always been in school. so I, And everybody I knew was dying of AIDS. It was a train wreck of a time. Um, and maybe it was a perfect storm for somebody like me to, to begin to have another experience. But the experience that I did have that was sort of a preview of the upper room, and that was an experience of energy. The first one was all just cosmic energy going through me, going, what the hell is this? But I knew I was safe and I knew I had asked for it. A few years later, I hit a real dark patch. And I was thinking, maybe I need to go back to drinking. Maybe none of this is going to work. I don't know what to do anymore. And uh, there was this prayer that somebody, had, people st used to put prayers in the back page of the old village voice and say, mm -hmm. say this for three days. And at the time I thought, well, nobody else is giving me any guarantees. I'm going to say this thing for three days. The village voice will give it, it to me. <laughs> well, something, somebody had an experience and they liked it enough to reprint it. It's, 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 if you get your prayer answered, reprint it. So somebody got it and I went, okay, why not? You know, and I said the thing and I got to say, I woke up the fourth day and I had really been under, I had been really, I mean, 12 step, I mean, you should talk about the committee and all these voices in your head. And I wasn't even sleeping. I was just so ragged. And what I experienced after that, the fourth day I woke up and my, everything was quiet and still. Mm. And I knew, I got to say, I knew like clear cognizance out through, it was crazy. I knew I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And I was walking around New York. I probably had like 45 cents to my name. I'm really not kidding. And I knew everybody else was too. The bum there, the businessman there, everybody was in this sort of perfect dance. And I was astonished. And it lasted about three days. And what it really was was a state of communion that I didn't even know was possible. I just knew I had this burning in my chest, which I now equate with the divine self, divine spark, whatever you want to call it. And when it, when it ended after about three days, I thought I'd done something horribly wrong. I thought I'd arrived. But I, what I did get to do was go back and do the work to, to sort of have another, have that become more ordinary to me. At the time, it was just... You know, when the guides say this sometimes, you know, if you've been in a dark room and there's too much light that comes in at once, you want to run high back in the shadows. Yeah. So we get brought, I think, forward as we can hold it. At least that's been my, my experience still. One of the things they said in the Book of Innocence that I really loved when they were talking about you breathing, and they were saying, look, as he inhales, he's taking in as much as his lungs are capable of holding, whatever his capacity is. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that's kind of 
the same thing as as you you know work as they say to the upper room or change your frequency or grow or evolve um you do as much as you're capable and you can handle and yeah. it's slowly you gain more and more capacity yeah i believe it you know i i get cautious when people want stuff too quick you know because I think you can blow your system out. I might have done that myself, but I do think that how the guides say it this way, you know, we can only we can only take in what we can hold. Just like when people talk about manifestation, if you can't hold it, you're not going to keep it. It's like those people that win the lottery, you know, and they're broke again in a year. You know, they just they don't have the consciousness to hold that. And I, I think that there's something to be said for coming into oneself or this part of oneself in, in gradation. It's not that there aren't big experiences to be had along the way. I've had a few and it sounds like you have and others have. And, and I think they're great, but I think they're markers on a journey. They're not necessarily the destination. You know, they're ways of knowing or getting some understanding of the motion forward or upward or whatever you want to call it. You know, you get to sort of see the signposts on the road to say, oh, this is all different than I thought it was. And then, like, if you go to a new country, you still have to learn the language. You know, you're someplace else, but you don't know how to speak the language or order your dinner, you know, and that's the next step. Once you go to the next stage, you get to learn there. Do you feel like in your journey now you see more signposts? Not, yes and no. You know, when I first came to Maui, that was nuts how much was going. That was just crazy. I had gone on a bad blind date to Hawaii years before with a Spanish dolphin communicator. I hope he's not listening to this. I mean, it was not his fault. It was a but, bad but I date. just love that your blind date was in Hawaii. I, went, I flew all the way to Hawaii. <laughs> and a reminder to everyone, you were in New York at the time. I was in New York at the That's time. That's like not a I close didn't realize. Trip. I was like, oh my God, what did I say yesterday? But anyway, I said I would never go back to Hawaii as long as I lived. I meant it. I'm never going to go back there. And um, I had a friend when, when COVID hit and I was in Costa Rica, I couldn't get back to New York because it had shut down while I was working. And a friend said, come to Maui. And the guides, when I had met this guy who'd first been a client years before, they had said to me, you need to trust him. And I thought, why do I need to trust him? And they, but they said, I said it to him. I said, I know why they're saying I need to trust you. And we became very good friends. Mm. And when he invited me up. He said, come to Maui. I went, I guess I'm supposed to trust him. And I did, you know, he found That's me a little just... tiny house to stay in. And, you know, I, I came, my dog was in, everything was in New York. I had nothing to do, nothing to worry about. I couldn't do anything. But there are all these funny things. I did a podcast with this guy, Duncan Trussell, who I didn't know. And he asked the guy something and I answered, oh, that's what Ram Das says. And I go, who, what, you know what? And then I was at Esalen and I had an experience with a giant monkey looking down at me when I was getting body work, you know. So I said, there's a giant monkey looking down at me. And the therapist said, well, I was praying to Hanuman before you. I was like, what the heck? Because I didn't know who that was. And I wound up on Maui. And my buddy Brent is saying, you really need to meet these Ram Das people. I think you're supposed to meet them. And Ram Das had died less than a year before. And I'm very shy. And I don't invite myself anywhere. So I was like, that's not going to happen. But I was doing readings still to, you know, pay the rent in New York, which I was where I wasn't even living. And there's this nice guy who shows up on, you know, Skype. And he said, I said, I'm sorry, my internet's so bad, I'm on Maui. He said, well, I'm on Maui. And he was one of Ram Dass's caregivers. You know, out of the blue, he booked me. He'd heard me on Duncan's thing. And then I ended up being welcomed, really, into the satsang. I feel so fortunate, these kind people, you know, and I live not far from them now. It's been a, it's been a wild thing, but the signposts were all over the place. And I, you know, the guides I work with used to tell people sometimes at the end of workshops, I'd say, well, this was all great, but what happens if, what happens when I go home? And the guides used to say, you know, you don't have to go home. Mm. You think you do, but it's your choice. And I just never went home. That's what happened. You know, I didn't go home. It was the best thing ever. I mean, I've been back to New York and stuff, but I really left my How life. does it feel when you go back to New York? Funny, you know? 
I was born there and I lived there most of my life. I was away through, you know, junior high and high school and a bit of grad school. I was always there. I don't miss it. I miss convenience. And I, like very the, convenient. I miss the edge of it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm very airy fairy. I'm not very woo woo. There's a lot of that here on Maui. There's a lot of woo woo. It's fine, but I'd rather, you know, uh, you know, I like it when people are sort of straight talking. But I'm appreciative of it. You know, I've got family there still, and um, I'm happy to go back when I'm back. But I have no, at this point, no desire to live there again. Isn't it so interesting how just things end, like cycles end, and it's not anything. And I feel like the guides kind of talk about that a lot. It's not necessarily you could put shoulds on it. Like, well, I loved it so much, so I should want to live there still, or I'm from there, so I should. But it's if you yeah. don't do that, you can have a whole different experience. Well, it's that whole thing about ordering what you think is on the menu. This is what I'm allowed to have. I had every reason why I shouldn't move or shouldn't leave, you know. And, um, and I don't think I necessarily would have had I not been literally, you know, picked up like, you know, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and dumped someplace else. It's really what happened. I couldn't go home. Do you feel like your work has changed by living there? Is there anything with your ability to connect? I mean, not that you ever were having issues with that there, but has anything changed that way? I'm, I personally, Paul, am much more peaceful than I've ever been in my life. Mm. And I think some of that's a reflection of being here. Um, you know, I think my reading abilities are probably better and they've channeled, I don't know, four or five books since I've been here, you know, in four years. Um, it's crazy. It is, yeah. But, you know, the books take weeks to a couple of months at the most and there's no editing. I mean, it's just sheer dictation. They're published unedited from the transcripts. They're corrected. It's my typo. I, I don't even type it anymore. There's a transcriptionist that does it. But if I stumble over a word, that's corrected. But that's about it. So it's been a productive time. But it's been, a, I have to say, it's been a gentle time in most ways. Mm. And that was really nice, you know. I didn't know I need, I didn't even know I needed that. But I'd been on the road for about five years. When I left teaching, when I left teaching college, and, you know, I was leaving two academic positions at a time when other people were considering getting ready for retirement. And I was just walking away from stuff. So I wanted to make sure I could pay my, you know, health insurance and all those things. And I worked for a while. And I also liked being on the road. So I had done that. But I was tired, too, by the time I got here. So, you know, one of the things we talked about last time when you were saying you take in about 5% when you're yeah. channeling. Yeah. But then it's when you're reading the books, you really kind of understand or see mm -hmm. what transpired. Yeah. And I know you're saying you don't edit anything. Has there ever been a moment you're reading the book and you actually just don't understand something and you reopen the channel? No. I mean, there have been to because I, I interrupt a lot, you know. Right. I love it. I find you your know, questions but, so helpful. But I, I, I don't understand something at the time. You'll hear the guy say, you know, Paul is interrupting, you know, and then I'll, I'll throw my question into the mix and hope that they answer it. I think there are a few times when I'm, because I don't sit down and read the book to read it. I sit down to read the book when I'm, I'm recording the audio book. That's the first time I go through it. it. And occasionally I'll go, I'll see something that I think could have been punctuated differently for clarity, you know, which was something that I just missed. But it's clear, but, you know, it, could, it would have been more helpful to understand it if it was broken up into two sentences or had a parenthesis stuck in the middle of a sentence that was unwieldy. And I think once or twice I'd go, well, they could have said that better. But I don't think it's that they could have said it better. I think it probably had more to do with my ability to hear. There's one word that they used to use. I think they still do, but it's very, very rare now. If I have trouble hearing a word in a, in a, in a channeling, and you'll hear me in recordings, it's probably on the, on the Internet someplace going, other word, other word, other word. I'm mm -hmm. asking for another word because I don't know what they're, what they're trying to say. And then they'll often shove a word in there. And the word, I think, was respond, respond or responding. And for some reason, that word, how they use it, allows them to rephrase the sentence in a new way. 
Um, and it's which is interesting. So really interesting. I notice those things when they occur. And I just think they got adept at working with me and my my limitations. I don't think I'm a perfect channel. I think I'm a very clear one. Um, and I understand that my role as a channel is to be the receiver or the radio for a broadcast. So it's not about Paul, really, you know. Um, I think if it were about me, unless they want to talk about me directly, which sometimes they do as a mm -hmm. subject, but it's not about how good am I doing. It's about what are they saying and am I able to relay it accurately? It's like being the court stenographer. That's the job. You know, just talking to you now, I kind of love that we're just chatting about some of this yeah. stuff. It's lovely because we haven't done this since the first interview, I feel like. But um, do you feel like there's any, obviously, I know you guys made an agreement before you came to this, you know, incarnation. And they've talked about in the books, too, that we kind of choose our situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you go back to like that history of how hard it was for you and really like having, you know, money in your pocket and you know, the smoking, all these things. And when you talk about kind of the dismantling for you is like a big one. Mm -hmm. Do you, it's interesting. I feel like in some ways it's what makes you so besides being a great channeler and also I've said a brilliant teacher of what you're channeling. I feel like being someone that has really gone through it mm -hmm. makes you even more effective. And like, I think people almost trust you more do you think that's in, like that's part of the reason knowing that this is what you are going to do? Well, not knowing, but coming into this world. This is where I get woo woo. Bear with me. Okay. That you chose kind of those situations of life, those difficult things. So in some ways, you are the everyman teaching this otherworldly stuff. You know, I don't know. I do think because a lot. You know, when I work as a psychic, which is different than the work as a channel, I step into people. You know, so. Somebody's having a problem with their kid, you know, they'll say, my, my daughter's name is Janice, she's 21, I'll step into Janice, I may start to look like her, and I can hear the dialogue at a higher level between the mother and the daughter and what's up. But because I've had a large spectrum of emotional experience, real highs and terrible lows, I'm able to recognize things. I can step into somebody who's ready to jump off the roof and understand that feeling. Mm. I'm not trying to protect myself from it. I'm not taking on their pain. I don't need to do that. But I, I got to say, I think it allowed me a kind of compassion, what I went through, that may be able to help other people. But I also don't, like anything else, I'm wary of anything that anybody says, well, this makes me special or better. It's just been part of my experience. Was it? This is, this is the easiest way to put it. Everything gets used. Everything we've been through is grist for the mill. Really, really is. And all of my years teaching college, I learned a great deal there. And being broke, I learned a great deal. I learned that I didn't want to be broke. But I also learned the lessons of abundance in through source in a different way, you know, which is my job isn't the source of my good, you know, and you, you, you begin to look beyond the thing that you think you're supposed to have. And then you have access to perhaps what's beyond that, which is greater. And that's a nice thing. It was useful. It really helped. When you say, you know, everything is grist for the mill, you know, yeah. everything gets used. And I know you're saying that about everybody. But yeah. Um, can we like, bring that into kind of some of the text of the book of innocence when a lot of it is how do we how do we like rearticulate as they say or how do we bring in our history in a different mm -hmm. way is that a way that you feel like is helpful to do that to realize everything is useful instead of you know because they talk a lot and you should talk about it more than i do but they talk a lot about how you know, when you're looking at history through fear and through separation and through the lower frequency of which stuff happened, then you're still creating separation. And then what we talked about earlier in this podcast, you keep creating from that place mm -hmm. versus it's not that you're pretending history didn't happen or you didn't have those jobs or you didn't have 45 cents to your name. It's just how can the frequency of which you, you know, attach to it and are part of it changes. Well, I don't know. Um, First of all, I don't think what happens to us is who we are. I think that's just what happened. 
how we respond to these things, I think, is determined by a number of things, you know, who we think we are in our family, in the world, in our culture, all those things, what's permissible, what's not, all those things. And I think those things change. They're, they're often transitional or transitory agreements. You know, what a man's supposed to be now is probably perceived very differently than it was 40 years ago. Yeah. You know, and everything else. We're all we're in great change. So the, the memory piece, I'm, I've am i been thinking about it a bit because I'm writing it and I'm actually it's remembering it. It's really, it's really weird because in the Book of Innocence, they talk about the reclamation of memory. And not that memory is bad. Um, we, I need to know where you, you know, I left the, the car keys, I suppose, if I could drive my car. I need to <laughs> them. But I have the car. I even know where the keys are. I just can't legally drive it. It's important to, to, to understand memory, but it's also, I think, useful when they say that the divine or the presence of source, whatever you want to call it, can be renowned in memory and not excluded from it. So if I'm saying God could not be or whatever that God is, whatever my idea of God is, God could not be in that terrible thing that happened to me or to those people or over in that part of the world. If God could not be there. They say the denial of the divine is the biggest and really only problem that we face. Hmm. To bring the presence of the divine upon the place where it appears most lacking, they say, is to transform what you see. And the idea of renewing memory in the same way is, I don't think it's so much a strategy. I think it's where we come to. So I suppose it could be as simple as I want to blame my ex for all of my hardship for the rest of my life. And I can choose to do that if I want to, but it's not going to get me anything good. You know, if I can remember or re-know the relationship in a different way, I'm not deciding that somebody wasn't awful in, in terms of their behavior, but I am changing my relationship to what I thought was. And I'm bringing the idea of source in where it was denied. So the guides say it very, very simply. Who you put in darkness, what you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. You see, it's a metaphysical law. You know, what you damn, in other words, or who you damn, which is to put outside of God, they say, damns you back. Mm-hmm. And what you bless, and they say a blessing isn't the platitude that people now use it as blessings and prayers for the people killed in the, in the shooting, you know, which is, what does that mean, you know? What a real blessing is, they say, is realizing the inherent presence of source where it was denied. Hmm. That is bringing the light to the darkness. And they say that is how things changed. You know, that's how things change. When the Book of Truth was dictated, which is a real tough book in some ways, it was right before the Trump Clinton election. And, um, you know, they say every they said everything that's been buried is about to be exhumed. And if you look at the world that followed, a lot of that came right after. And they say, you know, the purpose is not to blame what is exposed. It's to see it so that you can bring the light to it. Nothing gets healed by blame ever. You know, accountability is different, I think, than blame. Holding accountability is different than, than the need to blame. But they say, you know, if you look at your backyard, and this is happening in you, it's all of us personally and collectively in a, in a shared landscape. If your backyard is, is like suddenly like an archaeological dig, it's going to look like hell for a while. You know, mountains of dirt and great big holes, and you don't want to fall in, you know, but this is all, all, all opportunity. So I suppose memory is the same kind of thing. You know, what yeah. we have buried, what we've excluded from source gets brought back to source. And then our relationship to it can be altered. We're no longer a victim of it, you know. How does forgiveness come into play with what you are? I'm, 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 well, there's two different ways to talk about it, I think. I believe in it as, as a, a spiritual principle, but I also think it can be misunderstood. So I can understand, for example, that God or whatever you want to call God made the rattlesnake, but the rattlesnake has the potential for biting me in the ass and killing me. So I don't have to invite it into my living room, but I can allow the rattlesnake to be what it is. 
In the Book of Mastery, the guides have a little meditation. They said, imagine that you're walking up a mountain, and in that mountain, on that mountain is a cave, and in that cave is the one person you never want to see again as long as you live. And your job is to escort that person out of the cave and into the light. They said, you're the one that put them in darkness. And consequently, they have called you to them there. So the idea of forgiveness is about liberating ourselves from the darkness that we put another in. It's that mm -hmm. simple. It doesn't mean you have to have dinner with them. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if somebody punched you in the nose um, and they like to punch people in the nose, maybe you don't want to hang out with that person, but you can forgive them for being who they are. You know, one of the guides' simplest teaching is we have to forgive other people for not being who we want them to be. Mm. I want them to be the one that wouldn't have punched me in the nose, but that's what they're doing. So I think the um, I think forgiveness is essential because what it really is is an, it's an untethering or an unattaching to the negativity. It doesn't mean necessarily that we are responsible for somebody else's happiness if they want to. I don't know, come back with us. And it wasn't, it was a, it was a necessary ending. You can do that. But you know, there are people that I have a harder time forgiving than others, but there's, I'll tell you this story. It's a little one. There was a woman who fired me from a writing job. This is before my, the first books came right before the first book came, she fired me from a writing job and I was really mad. It was a playwriting gig, you know, and I was, and then I heard she died a few years later and I was, and I was like, wow, I guess I should feel something. And she was young. I thought, well, that's sad, but I didn't, I was, I was pissed at her. And shortly after I heard that she died, I was falling asleep and I saw her show up and she'd been a 12 stepper and she came up to me and it was like, she was holding a list <laughs> and she came up and she said, I'm sorry. Okay. And I was like, what? And I said, okay. <laughs> she said, good. And she stormed off. And I'm sure she was going to the next person. She was doing her ninth step, which was making amends to everybody <laughs> from the other side because she didn't want to carry the karma. And I've never had a bad thought about that woman again. I have actually only good feelings for her. And frankly, if she hadn't axed me from that job, the first book never would have been channeled. That was it created the opening that allowed for that to happen. It was perfect divine order. <laughs> but I love that story because I think we both got what we needed in that moment. But again, there's no negativity there at all. That's, yeah, I get that. I mean, it's funny and this is kind of like a harsh thing, but it always surprises people. I have an ex-boyfriend who cheated on me back in the day a few times and I've never had any, really any, I mean, I did in the moment, don't get me wrong, but with a little bit of distance and not that much, I quickly was like, saw it very differently and had nothing but like love for him, not in a way of like, we should be together yeah. in a very friendly way. And honestly, through time, all like the ladies that were part of all this somehow came into my life and I'm friends with all of them. And they're all really great girls because he had good taste. You know what I mean? So it's like, it was, and I always think about that because it's such an extreme thing where I should just be like, He's awful. They're awful. They're yeah. horrible. And it just dissipated. And I've always wondered why, especially around that, it dissipated very quickly. And I was always very grateful for it yeah. because then I wasn't carrying it. It didn't affect me. And it allowed me to see people as just yeah. people. It's great. It's the best, you know, and I, I think it's true. I think the guides have said to me and to everybody many, many times, self-righteousness is always the small self, which is the personality structure. So every time I'm on my high horse, I have to look at that, which is I'm acting out of my need to be right, my need to be justified. You know, and I can do that if I want, but I do believe that there is a penalty for some of that. That doesn't mean that we don't act on our own behalf, which is healthy self-esteem. That's not self-righteousness. It's not okay to do this, you know, and I deserve a partner who is agreeing to be in a monogamous relationship if that's what we've chosen together. That's a fine thing. But, you know, when I'm I, when I need to be right at the cost of somebody else being wrong, that's when I have to look at it, you know, and that's when I'm usually in my own way. It's so it's, you know, on that note, because in, in the book, they go in a little bit deeper about 
you know, seeing kind of God or source or however, whatever words people want to use to this in everybody, because we all are one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the person like flipping you off, like in the car, if they're pissed at you or the road rager or the person, your neighbor, I think they use the example of a neighbor in a flower bed or something. Um, and talk a little bit, because you're starting to get there. Because I, I think it's really important that the difference of you know, seeing love in all, you know, seeing source in all, but yet creating still healthy boundaries. Um, I mean, I, they, they can talk about this probably better than I can. I don't know that I, I'm going to channel here. Um, in 12-step land, you'd hear people say things like, look for the good or the God in everybody. And it's a simple, simple, simple way forward. It makes a huge difference. I am, as I said, kind of porous. I pick up on stuff. You know, it's hard for me sometimes. My idea of an awful, awful time is to be in a crowded mall, and I would never go probably to a rock concert in the stadium. It would just be too much for me, too much people, too much noise, too much energy. But I also feel that I'm responsible for my boundaries as I wish them, and I don't think the boundaries are there to exclude intentionally. I think they're there kind of in a healthy way. So I have, um, you know, a fence, you know, I have a, I have a front gate where I live and I'm happy to let people in, but I'm also happy to keep the gate closed because if I don't, you know, the tourists who are looking for places to park their car so they can go to the waterfalls or something are going to show up and park in my yard. And I'd rather not have that. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't honor their right to be. I also honor my right to say I would like some peace and quiet where I live. So I don't think I'm answering this. I do know what the guides say, and they're, they're far more evolved than I am around this, which is really simple. What you're seeing or what you're perceiving is the inherent divinity and the other one beyond what they represent beyond what they have done or you think they've done or you would decide for them or the culture would say about them, all those things. Those are all transitional ways of deciding and they're born in judgment, most of them. And they say, what you judge, you fear. You know, and it's a simple, simple teaching. So mm -hmm. my willingness to go beyond my prescriptive nature about how somebody should behave and what is acceptable to me is probably where I'm growing the most. It's easy to forgive somebody who slighted you. It's harder to forgive somebody who, you know, really, you know, who, who hurt your child or got you fired from your job or whatever it was that you thought you needed or shouldn't have been protected. It's much harder. But I also, you know, I remember once watching, I think it was like Oprah or something, it was years ago, and there was some guy who had forgiven the person who killed his son hmm. and stood up in court when the guy was being sentenced and said that. And the man who was about to go to prison for this dissolved in tears. I mean, it was astonishing to watch. It meant everything. And interestingly enough, the father stayed in touch with the man. And later, I think when he was released, they became friends. Oof. But that's somebody who's so far along. You know? <laughs> I, I just don't know if I'm there yet. But there are people that do. And I think that's, you know, I, I was raised an atheist. You know, that's how I was raised in New York City. Um, but I think when somebody's really practicing Christianity, true Christianity, which includes a teaching of forgiveness, which is huge. I think there's tremendous beauty there. But the other thing is, I think all, all the religions hold it in one way or another. They just speak about it in different ways. And as my guides often say, you know, what is true is always true. Even if it's not popular, what's true is always true. And the essence of who somebody is or the God within that person, that's what is always true. How they present in terms of their physical appearance or their gender or their status in the world, all that stuff is transitional. All of it, all of it. You're going beyond appearance to source when you do that kind of witnessing and it's potent and powerful and, and really life-changing. 
I've been, I've been changed by that. So I know. Yeah. So talk also about to that. I mean, one of the things they say in the book of innocence too, is make it be clear that if you're doing this, what did they say? If you're doing this because you think you're helping someone, you're not quite understanding what we're teaching. So to the point of this man forgiving someone who murdered his son, he wasn't doing it to like be this. He wasn't trying to be spiritual. He right. wasn't trying to show how far along he was. He was doing what I believe he, he knew in his heart to be right. And, um, and it was, it was some. So, but then inevitably it did change. It did change. Yeah. The it vibration did. for it everyone. Does. It always does. The guides say this all the time. The book that, that's next, which is a world made new is really about all about all about how matter is altered through the witnessing of the divine mm. or the restoration of what has been denied. I mean, that's really where they've been going to in, in their work. It's they said in the very first book. You know, yeah. They hint at it in this one too. Yeah. That's where they're going with this. So, they say, for example, God sees God in all of its creations. So when you're aligning at a level of awareness of source, you can begin to perceive at that level, which is beyond the mandates of the personality or the culture. The idea of not using this stuff to fix people is really useful and helpful because mostly we're trying to fix people to think to be what we think that they should be. Well, they should be happier. So I'm going to do this so that they can be happier. Maybe they're getting exactly the lessons that they need at this moment. Now to bring the presence of the divine upon them or to witness the divine upon them isn't to fix them or to repair that. If that needs reparation, it can happen. But you're not deciding what somebody should be like. If my mother had had me fixed that way when I was five years old, I'd be a straight attorney now. <laughs> be something very different than I wound up being, but I'm uniquely Paul, you know, just as you're uniquely you. And some of how we become who we are, I think, is through the lessons we get. And that might not be popular, you know, so trying to fix people isn't the point of this work, but people are changed and benefit through it. That I do know. So speaking of like, I'm uniquely me and you're uniquely you, one of the conundrums that I found so interesting in this book, because there's always amazing conundrums that then they, you know, work out, was this idea, and you just hinted to it also, that personality, if you're ascribing personality traits to yourself, then you're not really sitting in the true self. You haven't, you haven't quite yet gotten there. And it's so interesting, as they also say, like, you choose how you want to come into this version yeah. So how do we reconcile I don't, that? Well, I don't remember the teaching that you're referencing, but I, I can try to, to speak to it. Please. When I was 30-ish and struggling, maybe a little older, 30, it was in my late 30s. I just broke in with a teacher and a mentor. It was like hard. But I used to hear this thing, freedom will come when the throne relinquishes its king. I wrote it down on a slip of paper. I didn't understand it. Now I understand it. And I'm always saying 99% sure that I heard it in channel because I don't know otherwise why I would have written it down to understand. So the question then is who sits in the throne? What aspect is running the show? You know, my personality self has an edict or a mandate about how things should be, how, think, how he should be treated, how the world should operate to suit his needs, all of those things. Whereas the divine self or the monad as they call it knows more. So the question is who sits in the throne? It's really that simple. The personality self has its place. We need it. It's part of how we operate. I don't think having, I don't think an ego is a bad thing, but I don't think that it's who we truly are. It's a way of knowing ourselves through history and in relation and is useful at that level. Now, the guides speak about the integration of the personality in the higher way. So we all have unique fingerprints. You know, that's part of who we are, but the substance of what makes us all is the same substance, finally, which is source. And when they're asking us to recognize our inherent divinity, they're asking, I think, us to move to the understanding of where we're unified with others, you know, where we are one with all and not about the separation. The challenge with the separation, they say, is that it's, it's somewhat deceitful. You know, now I have my body, you have your body, I'm in my house, and all those things are well and good. 
But when we start claiming everything in separation, we start building walls. And I already used my gate example. That should show you how unevolved I am, I guess. <laughs> but the idea of the, of the walls, they use a lot. And they say, so, you know, you plant your garden. You don't want your neighbors coming in and foraging through your garden. So you build a wall. And then they try to climb over. You build a higher wall. Then you get a gun. Then you get a bomb. Mm. That's war. And that's what we've done. And until we realize the source of supply is universal and start stop parsing things and stop hoarding things and stop operating in a world where some are supposed to suffer and be impoverished and you know be destitute and others are supposed to you know have everything we're going to have a rough rough time and that's for us to realize we're the ones that we're the ones that created the separation we're, we're choosing to learn through it and they say we can learn through that as long as we want until we're all dead you know you can learn the war is stupid until you know when there's no until there's nobody left standing and it seemed in this book, they speaking of the war, it was really, I felt like they spoke about war almost more in this book in the sense, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm more attuned to it, um, in a sense that it was, they were really, they, they've always mentioned like humanity is going through a change, but this mm -hmm. really felt very specific, like big stuff is happening, mm -hmm. everything's happening, and the separation is ending, I felt like they said, but in that process, it's pretty ugly. Like yeah. to get there. It's not smooth sailing to get from point A to point B. And to your point, when you were talking about the book of truth came out, like when it actually was released, it was right before that like election. Mm -hmm. I found this fascinating too, because I'm like, I, I remember when you were writing it, <clears throat> which was different, but it did come out in the fall. And then the world kind of blew up again. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah, the, the book was published in September. And yeah, all, all this stuff. And I know, happened. especially. Yeah in where they reside, there's no time. <laughs> so it just feels very much, and it's gonna be hilarious because you'll be like, yes, of course, like they know what they're doing. Like it's coming out exactly to teach us. It felt like their way of talking about what's happening right now. Yeah. It's been that way from the beginning. I mean, I suppose someday if any, if this work sticks around at all, somebody will decide to go through them and sort of look at them on a timeline and see what was being taught and what was happening in the world. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was present in all of the texts um, when they talk about this stuff, but they have their own way of doing it. You know, there are times, I remember this when they were channeling it and I'm thinking, what is this there? Why are they harping on this so much at the time? But I've had that experience before. Right. That's so interesting. Then, you know, and then the book comes out and then things happen. So, you know, they've been talking for a number of years about the collapse of systems, you know, economic, educational, you know, you know, medical, all of these governments, all of this stuff and not in a way that's necessarily cataclysmic or anarchistic. They, they said from the very first book, humanity is at a time of reckoning. And a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And everything that's been created in fear is going to need to be recreated in a higher way. So if the mortar that holds a system together is greed, which is fear-based, you know, um, maybe the, the wall come crumbling a little bit so that something else can come in its place that's higher. I think that's the purpose of the time. And they've said this, they said this in a lecture like yesterday, but they said, you know, when, it, when a tree starts to grow, it breaks through the earth as it goes. It, it disrupts the earth as it seeks to, to sprout. And, you know, the, the roots dig deep. It's not a graceful process. It's a process of disruption, but it's organic. And that that's kind of where we're going. And they're hopeful. They, they say four generations will start to see the changes. I hope that's true. I do too, because it's. I found it so interesting with everything going on, because one of the main tenets of this whole thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, is, again, looking at history and claiming mm -hmm. it in a different fashion. Yep. And I keep looking at what's happening, let's say, in the Middle East, and I won't go specific with size or anything, because I don't want to do that. But as far as I can talk about it generally in the sense that because I kept thinking, okay, like I can reclaim, if I really want to step in, I can see how I can reclaim my own history. And I might not always be good at it, but I, I see how I can do it. Mm -hmm. Then I look at like family trauma of like years of families hating each other. And I'm like, okay, it takes one, you know, 
you know, sibling or one person with the other family that just happens to get along that can slowly shift that family trauma. But then I'm looking at the Middle East and I know there's, and especially now we've just kind of reset the cycle of hatred. There's so much hatred on both sides because, you know, it just takes this one killed, you know, my mom's so now I hate them. Well, this one killed my, on both, and it keeps going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as they talk about, and I think they use a metaphor of like, you're taking out a big boulder out of the cave and that humanity mm -hmm. is in the process of like removing the boulder. Yeah. I'm so confounded how on a larger scale that happens. <laughs> you know, they talked about it, I got to say, all through October, November, probably December. I don't know how many lectures they've done on this. I don't remember most of it, but they were on it in, in a real way. And um, I, I don't know, I suppose some of them we may have put up online. I'm actually not sure sometimes, you know, that we just say, well, let's share this. Um, but they're talking about how they are talking about how this happens is at a global level, because they say we, all of us, you, me, everybody, we're all contributing to what we see. If you can see it, you're in vibrational accord too. And if you know about it, if you can think about it, you're in vibrational accord. That simply means that you're operating at a level of alignment with the thing you see, which means your consciousness can shift it or can contribute to the shifting of it. So if I'm looking at the world from my basement transom window where perhaps we could put war at a low, as a low level creation, you're not going to do too much. If you go up higher to say the 25th floor, you can lift it to you. And that's their teaching, how things are lifted, how things are changed. You know, there are certain walls you don't climb over because you can't, but you can lift above. And that's a product of consciousness and, and the energetic work that they teach. And they do say that that's how a world is made new. Um, that's their teaching. So, you know, people think that manifestation is getting what you want. I want a bigger apartment. I want a better boyfriend. I want, you know, and it's all, can give me, give me, it's all this. This is the mudra of creation that they teach. They say, this is how we create. We're always creating. They say, what you don't see is that everything that you see, you're actually in alignment to. And then if you go to a higher mm -hmm. level, you begin creating from that level of consciousness. And what can be produced or claimed or known in manifestation is very different. And I, I believe it's true. And you can feel it when they work. You can feel the energy of it. That's so interesting because they do say, they use the word almost like you're consenting to it. Yeah. If you're... If you're at that level, you're consenting just by being around it. So that is interesting because one of the other things they talk about is how taking action in certain ways is almost consenting within it as well. And how, which I found fascinating. So then I was like, okay, so then where does that balance become of like taking action and not taking action? Yeah. Um, because they said, and this goes back, I think, to the book before where it's like, because then you're, you're being part of separation because you're putting a subconscious judgment, even if you think your judgment's correct, it's like you're subconsciously deciding what is right and what is wrong. I don't recall the teaching again. I mean, I, you know, I haven't read the book since the audio book and this one came so fast. The last two came so fast that I actually was just mind boggled and was trying to keep up with the dictation. I, I suspect what you're referencing is this thing which is that if you are antagonizing something, you're feeding it, you're giving it the energy of the antagonism, which means you're moving into a, a level of accord at that level with it, which is different than addressing it from the higher. Now, but the guides have also said in all of the books, you know, if you're walking down the street and somebody is getting attacked and you're in a position to stop it, you stop it. Right. If somebody's stepping on your foot, you say, please get off my foot. If they keep doing it, call the cops. Right. What do you need to do? Do you know? I mean, I don't think it's about passivity at a level of, of inaction necessarily. I do think it's about what aspect of us is being motivated by the need to act. So if it's my, if, if I am... If I am somebody, for example, that's always been bullied and I have a great store of, of shared outrage around this, I am more than happy to throw it in the direction of the one who I think is being harmful. And I can do that 
and maybe I'll make a difference, but perhaps there are other ways of changing things or of shifting things, which is a better word, beyond attack at the old level, you know? So it, it's that, that simple, simple teaching, what you damn damns you back, which simply means what you put in darkness calls for the darkness. That's vibrational accord. If you go to the higher and you claim the light, that doesn't mean you're being airy-fairy and presuming that things will get done. And the guides have said, if somebody's hungry, feed them. This is practical, practical stuff. Don't, don't be a, a good new ager and say, well, they created this. <laughs> no, that's their karma. You know, if you have the food, give them a freaking spoon and a bowl and fill it up. We can do these things. If I can help stop something that's harmful to somebody else, that's a good thing to do. But it's not about the need to be vindictive, which is, again, an act of, of outrage and anger. I don't think that ever helps anybody. Right. It is really fascinating, the timing. I mean, I guess it's not that fascinating. It makes sense. I have one more question, then I'll let you go, because I know I've had you for a while. So going back to memories, because so much of this, again, is about memories and history. And, you know, they say, obviously, we've talked about how it's how you reclaim your memory. It's not that the memories go away. But they do say you have to see it to kind of, you have to be able to see it to reclaim it. Mm -hmm. Have they talked at all about, like, subconscious memories? Like, what if someone had a deep trauma that they actually don't remember, but it is affecting them energetically. Yeah, they talk about it, and they talk about ways to work with it energetically. I think if I was supposed to remember everything, I would. You know, I think there's a reason people don't have recall on past life stuff. I don't know that we need it. I do believe that if something needs to be healed, the evidence of it will come up in its own way. So if I have a problem with intimacy, I may not get to the root cause of the problem, but I can still attend to the problem through the relationships that come up in present time. But they do talk about the old wounds and they do address how to work with it energetically in, in, in this book and a number of the books. I mean, I'm so appreciative of you always. You always are so enlightening. I know it's not you. I know you're going to say it. But just talking to you, you have so many fantastic stories and how you've also assimilated the work is just really helpful to hear. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, always. I can't wait for the next one. Okay.